Allegheny County Board of Education for December the 7th, 2022. Can we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Shanna. Pursuant to the general provisions, Articles 3, 305, 3, and 3, 104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County met in the closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda before us? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Second. I motion to second. All those favor say aye. 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 You've had a chance to look at our minutes uh, for November the second closed session? Yes. Yes. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve the minutes as presented from November 2nd closed session. Second. second. Motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. You also have uh, minutes for a November 2nd open session in front of you. Yes. I move that we approve the minutes from the open session from November 2nd, 2022 as presented. A motion to second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We're, we're having uh, four <laughs> votes. Uh, Alexis is uh, standing on the kitchen right yeah. now. Okay, our next would be November 16th, closed session minutes. Everybody's had a chance? Mm-hmm, we've been looked. I move that we approve the minutes from the closed session, November 16, 2022, as presented. Second. <laughs> Motion second, all those who say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. seven, four, oh. And the final one is November 16th, open session. I move that we approve the minutes from November 16, open session, as uh, presented. Second. <laughs> You know, motion to second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Okay, thank you. We'll now proceed to election of board officers for the upcoming year. As far as I move that we um, nominate uh, Mark Schifanelli for president of the Board of Education. I move that we nominate Helen well, Bennett. Second. Okay, second. We got a motion. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, Helen nominates Mark Schifanelli, and we have a second. Second. Yes, Mark was second. Mark seconded, okay. Sure. I move that we vote Helen Bennett president. Second. Okay, we have uh, two nominees. Anybody else? Nominees for president of the school board? Okay, uh, can you fill out your things? Sorry, I was going to keep it. <laughs> it may be folded. I just need president. Just so. And congratulations to Mark Schiffinelli, our new president for Good. Queen Anne's County Board of Education. Thank you. Okay, now we'll have vice president, nomination vice president. Mr. President, um, Mr. Smith. I, uh, nominate Helen Bennett for our vice president. Second. I have a second. All, any other nominations of the floor? Okay. Everybody vote on that. Congratulations. And congratulations, uh, Vice President Helen Bennett. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Do you want to all right. Seats are you just fine there? No, we don't need to okay. switch seats. Um, awards presentations. Energizer Bunny Award, Dr. Yes. Simmons. Sure. Thank you. Board, if you'll join me, please. So this award is given to a staff member who, or a volunteer who continues to, um, continues moving and going. 
It is sponsored by Bayview Financial, which is Mr. Chip Frittingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys. If they could come forward, please. So our December Energizer Bunny is Mr. Michael Bell. So please come forward. <laughs> but both her and I have nominated Mr. Bell. It is with great pleasure that we present Mr. Michael Bell, Supervisor of Visual and Performing Arts, World Languages, Media, Service Learning, and Title IV Grants with the Energizer Bunny Award for the month of December. From his job responsibilities alone, you can see that Mr. Bell has to be extremely energetic and positive. Mr. Bell makes it a point to attend all of the visual and performing arts performances, along with the many art shows that are put on by the students and staff in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. He then follows up with press releases to ensure students and staff are recognized and so that the public knows what is happening in our school district. He stretches himself and goes above and beyond to ensure that his teachers have the needed support by conducting check-ins to stay connected in addition to scheduling observations and uh, monitoring visits. Mr. Bell also works to form strong partnerships with renowned presenters such as Peter, Gucci. <laughs> he was a choreographer and Graham Pepper. Thank you. <laughs> right, the CEO of Quaver Music to ensure enhance our, our teachers' professional learning. He advocates for current and relevant instructional materials for all of his content teachers so that Queen Anne's County Public Schools remains on the cutting edge. Mr. Bell is sought out after to present at state and national conferences due to his expertise. And during his tenure in Queen Anne's County Public Schools, he has developed Artscape featuring student artists in grades K through 12, along with faculty art shows and art team of the week. Under Mr. Bell's supervision, he ensures students are recognized for their proficiency in two or more languages upon high school graduation with the seal of high literacy. He still finds time to support others when he, when he is needed, such as creating the design for the district's strategic plan. Mr. Bell has been featured in TED Talks and in other media platforms as he believes that you have to look within to be inspired and that you should always use your um, voice. He doesn't just speak about his beliefs, it's observable in his actions. It is not surprising that he's extremely motivated and captivating in his delivery when he facilitates and conducts professional meetings and professional learning sessions. Mr. Bell is truly an asset to Queen Anne's County Public School and all of his efforts are greatly appreciated. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Today, yeah. <laughs> Ms. Capes, could you move in just a little, sure. please? Thank you. All right, everyone, look this way, please. There you go. That's even better. Perfect. Thank you. Got it. <laughs> The next award is the Shining Star Award. This award recognizes someone in our school system who shines. December Shining Star is Mrs. Carrie Dennis, the Executive Assistant for the Superintendent. If she'll please come forward. <laughs> ooh, ooh. I have the privilege to work with Carrie on a day-to-day -day basis, and she truly is a shining star. If you look up the definition of shining, you will see it says brilliant, or excellent at something. A star is defined as a body that shines from an internal energy source. When entering my office, she will always be greeted with a smile and a I am happy to help you attitude. Her dedication to detail and overall abilities exceeds expectations. There is simply nothing she can't do. When in doubt, she figures it out. She jumps in and assists with other departments and is always supportive. I am lucky to have her on the executive team, and I know that all of my team members share my nomination. Thank you, Carrie, for being you and shining bright every day. Thank you. Do you have your family up? Yes, my mom and dad and husband are here, much to my surprise. <laughs> Good job. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the Queen Anne's County Public School Spirit Award. This award is given to an individual who embodies the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. December's Spirit Award winner is Renee Wolf. I'd like for her to come up. We would like to recognize Renee Wolf for the Queen Anne's County Public School Spirit Award. Renee is a hardworking employee that is always willing to go above and beyond. Renee has stepped up to help out with School Messenger, our district-wide communication system, getting up at 4 a.m., probably tomorrow, <laughs> with a smile to send out our early morning fog delay call. She has been instrumental in helping Dr. Kibler get the Blueprint Advisory Work Group up and running, the School System Improvement Committee up and running, and the Citizens Advisory Council up and running. With her efforts, these projects are organized, efficient, and run smoothly. Renee also helps organize central office activities, like our most recent central office Thanksgiving lunch, which brings employees together for a time away from their desks to get to know each other and build some relationships. Renee has an incredible work ethic and is always willing to lend a helping hand. We are so fortunate to have her on our team. Thank you for all you did. Don't run out there to eat. Thank you. You got it, Jill. I know. Honey, come on up front so I can see you in your red sweater. Perfect. Okay, everyone look this way, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I did the oysters with them. HBO. President Schiffinelli, could you just give us a minute, please? Yes. Thank you. Of course. See you next year, I guess. Another year. I know. Sorry, I noticed our uh, student members aren't here. No, not yet. I don't know. Both of them are, that's odd. That is odd. Okay. Ready to go? Um, one last thing, I was remiss. We, I'd like to introduce our new board member, Alexis Capes. Yes. Well, Hello, congratulations and welcome aboard. Welcome. Thank you. All right, board involvement. I don't see our student board members here tonight. Um, did they? One board member did say that he was sick. Mr. K Dr. Kibler has his write up, but the okay. other board member did okay. not notify us that he was not going to be here, so we uh, don't unfortunately have anything for him. So we'll start with the uh, elected members of the board. Um, would anybody like to be recognized to speak? Well, I just want to say uh, congratulations to the Kent Island Bucks. What an amazing season for um, football. Uh, we're all very, very proud of you and, and we're very grateful for all the support of the community um, that we got. So congratulations and well done. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, everybody's well aware of it, but a uh, few of our board members attended the superintendent's gala down at Ocean City, uh, and we do have the state superintendent, uh, Dr. Salins. Uh, that was a fun evening. Yes, Thank it you. was. Uh, Thank you very much. Also, uh, one, another highlight, one of the better highlights of the job, I got to go to Queen Anne's, I'm sorry, Central Elementary School with grandparents day to hear a concert. That was fun. Um, I got to give Ms. Fredell credit. I have never seen her without a smile on her face. Mm -hmm. I don't know how she does it, but she's 24 seven whenever I've seen her with a smile on her face. And also uh, picking up what uh, Helen said, I also attended over to, uh, Naval Marine Corps Stadium, uh, the Bucks playing in their final thing. And I'll tell you, I was very proud when they came out of the um, tunnel, they had the American flag in front of them and they all came out and that was very impressive and kudos to them. I know they'll remember this for a long time there and uh, very proud of them. Yes. 
Um, I would like to say congratulations to the Bucks too. I also attended that game. Um, I think they did really good. They started out really strong, um, got the best of them, but at least they made it to states and they played well while they were there. Um, I also attended Make a Difference Day. I was very impressed to see all of the services that this county provides for those in our county that have a need, whether it's um, additional health care jobs. I was very encouraged to see our CTE students from um, cosmetology doing uh, free haircuts. And there were some really, a lot of kids that came out with some really cool hairdos um, when they were done for the day. Um, I also attended my first uh, May budget committee meeting. So uh, I'll get the talk with Jane a little bit about some of the stuff that I learned while I was attending that. And thank you for nominating me to that committee and being able to participate. All right, anybody else? Ms. Capes. I just want to say thank you to everybody on the board and everybody else that I've met so far that's been so welcoming. I appreciate it. So thank you again. I do have one more thing, just because I was so excited about the Bucks. But yes, I attended for Dr. Salins as well. And we're very proud of you. And it was such an honor to go and um, well worth that drive out and back to be able to see how excited she was with her family and uh, well-deserved. And uh, so it was very exciting, very happy for you. All right, I'd like to say uh, congratulations as well to Ms. Capes um, and to Ms. Bent. You both ran campaigns and it, um, during the election season. Obviously, Ms. Capes was elected. Uh, Ms. Bent, you were too. You've already been with us for a year as an appointee. Um, so congratulations. And uh, I also want to commend um, the, the two persons, the residents of the county, uh, who were running on the same, for the same position. That's Mr. Ken Lang and uh, Chris Blanton. And I know those two ran uh, superb campaigns as well. I saw Mr. Lang out at the polling center uh, on Kent Island. Uh, it was rainy and it was cold and he was out there waving signs and, and talking to people. Uh, same thing with Mr. Blanton. And I commend them because um, both of them uh, have been in front of the board speaking before uh, when they took issue with, with certain you know, actions of the board and uh, they put their money where their mouth is and they spent the time to uh, fulfill their civic duty. Um, they had the time to run and they had the desire and, uh, and they did so. So, so kudos to, to both of them. And I think they serve an ex as an example of uh, those who can run for office uh, and have something to contribute should do so. So I did uh, attend Make a Difference Day as well. Saw Ms. Bent out there. And, um, and it was really uh, an impressive event. Apparently it's been going on for several years. And uh, the sea cadets, some of which our students, or our students uh, showed up to help um, with the attendees and get things set up. Uh, and it, it generally was just a very impressive uh, day all the way around. School visits, I was able to get out to some of the schools in the past couple of weeks. I got out to Churchill Elementary and uh, Southersville Elementary. And I read a book, <laughs> Dr. Seuss, uh, to some very happy looking, very healthy looking, and frankly, very savvy second graders uh, at both of those schools. It, it was really a delight. It really is the best part of this job, I think. And, um, and I was really impressed with, with everything, uh, the, the, the whole operation. I, I did uh, get a chance to see the uh, rehearsal for grandparents and special friends day mm -hmm. and uh, that was quite a treat and and uh, so congratulations to everybody out there keep up the good work uh, I visited some of the other schools as well I attended uh, mostly the, the Spanish language classes under Mr. Bell's uh, direction ultimately and um, and very impressed got to try my Spanish and didn't get any mean looks from the professor so I, I think I'm still good um, and uh, and that's about it. So, you know, I'd, I'd also like to recognize uh, outgoing president, Mr. Smith. Um, he's been president for two years. He took us through some very uh, tough times this past iteration with labor negotiations. Uh, it turned out to be more extended than we thought it would at first. Um, and uh, I know that uh, he is always keeping up with uh, future budget issues that we may or may not have, and I would expect it. He's going to uh, still contribute with his expertise 
uh, in his role as a uh, board member. So, Dick, thanks for stepping up to the plate for the past couple of years, and, uh, and great job. Okay. Anybody else got any comments? Dr. Salins? Yes, I just want to um, say thank you so much for all the support that I did receive. I'm still on cloud nine, um, but everything from those that came to help me celebrate to um, just supporting them and getting people there, um, the cards, flowers, everything, um, the congratulations, and I just really appreciate every bit of it. And I'm still, as I said, on cloud nine, and I'm happy to represent Queen Anne's County um, as we move into the national um, you know, so in February we'll find out, but I'm, I'm happy to be in that place and to represent uh, our district with pride. So thank you. And you know, Dr. Salins, uh, that just confirms uh, the decision of the board was the right one a year ago or a year and a half ago, because we had some very top-notch candidates and, uh, and you were the top of the top-notch. Thank you. So um, let's see, spotlight presentation. Yes, Dr. Kibler is going to sit in for Dr. Sprankle this evening. Okay. Would you like me to read um, the student mm -hmm. member? Sure, at that this would time be great. Well? Yeah. Oh. So he did, as I said, we had one student um, rep was actually not well this evening, so we're hoping he's feeling better. And so maybe I'll start with that if that's okay. So this sure. is for Mr. Toole from I think Queen Anne's County, correct? So he isn't feeling well. We hope you feel better. <laughs> um, I'll, so uh, he wanted everybody to know that uh, the Queen Anne's County High School ran three different drives during November, including a food drive that gathered over 1,500 items and worked, went towards feeding 500 families for Thanksgiving. Uh, they had a donation drive for residents at Caroline Nursing and Rehab Center and Operation Christmas Child Boxes. Thank you to all, everybody that um, helped with those drives. For December, they have the following events. Um, on the 9th, they have interim reports for quarter two. The 13th to 20th, the engineering club is selling candy grams during lunch. The 14th is the winter dance concert. And on the 21st, this is going to be the first sanctioned MPSSAA all-female dual wrestling meet at, at the high school. So please come out and support. Um, pretty great to see uh, the first one. Um, and winter sports are starting up throughout the, um, this week, and we look forward to uh, achieving great things. Right. So that's right. What date was that? Uh, the 21st. Thank you. All right, and then I also have uh, the spotlight for November. Uh, first, uh, at Centerville Elementary School, they celebrated uh, Grandparents and Friends Day. Um, on November 18th, they had over 1,000 visitors and performed six concerts. Uh, it was it was amazing. I I went over. My parents were there for my son, and it just filing in, filing them out. Six concerts. It was cool to see that many people. They did a great job. It's a great day. Kennard Elementary School on November 1st, they had a steam night that was held with staff, students, and family participating in a variety of science, technology, engineering, art, and math integrated activities. The Boys, boys Heroes and Girls on the Run Club met during the fall learning about tips for running, character building, goal setting, and more. Both clubs participated in two 5K events as um, culminating activities. And then continuing at Kennard, just some more pictures here. They had um, Grandparents Day and they, with a performance by fifth grade students, and they also celebrated Veterans Day with a special tribute to all veterans. Ken Island Elementary School, they had a tooth fairy assembly, Veterans Day celebration. Uh, students uh, were read to by both Dr. Sprankle and Dr. Salins. I know they, the kids always love that, and, and they, they each love every time they can get in the school's reading, just like Mr. Schifanelli was talking about. It's a great time. and. Uh, Star Students of the Month for November are there, and uh, notice their, their cool new logo. I would, mm -hmm. Everybody pretty excited about that down there, the blue crab. Sellersville Elementary School, there we have uh, President Schifanelli reading to the students. <laughs> I know everybody enjoys that. I know I do. You do? <laughs> Stevensville Middle School, they had their falling into Pirates Port. The first family and community falling into the Pirates Port event was held on November 7th. The family and community event featured performances by our band and chorus. 
academic games, community organi organization resources, a basket raffle, face painting, food trucks, and a book fair. They had over 300 guests of all ages for that, for that event. Nice. Queen Anne's County High School, uh, here we have some pictures from uh, their performance of Clue for fellow students, staff, parents, and community members. And then also wanna have a huge congratulations for Queen Anne's County High School to Kelsey, Brooke, and D. Ace, whose work was selected from entries across the state for the Maryland High School juried art exhibition. Um, and it, we have a note here that only about 45 student works across the state were, in, were entered into that, um, into that exhibition. So that's pretty impressive. And that's our spotlight for the month of November. Thank you, Laura. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Matt. Yeah. <clears throat> Citizen participation and public comments. Who's? We had none. No? no okay. No so sure. we're going to forego the reading, obviously. So there's no one here to, to speak tonight for citizen participation. Going once, going twice. All right. Information items. Uh, CTE program update. As Adam's coming up and um, getting his presentation up, mm -hmm. last um, time that we met, we had the proclamation for that week of the CTE proclamation for the um, recognition that under Adam's leadership, uh, we received because we have the most apprenticeships on the shore. So I just kind of want to recognize him again because without his leadership, that would not happen. Um, so kudos again to um, Mr. Tolley and his leadership with our apprenticeships and being number one on the shore. Thank you. There you can see that picture. Right. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, members of the board, executive team. For the record, my name is Adam Tolley. I'm supervisor of career and technical education and social studies for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And uh, as always, I always appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak about CTE and social studies, and in this case tonight, to speak about CTE. So the purpose tonight just to give an overview, general overview of our CTE programs, funding, accountability, uh, as it relates to the Maryland Blueprint, and of course to answer any question that, that you may have. And so feel free, please, to stop me at any point through the presentation to, to ask any questions. There's a lot, uh, a lot happening in CTE here in the state and nationwide. So um, again, just want to give sort of an overview of the, the funding, accountability, what we're doing here locally with, with CTE. Um, I'm not going to read through all this. This is just some uh, you know, some statistics that are pulled from ACTE, which is the national branch of CTE uh, for the United States. And really, it, this just sums up the, the value of CTE. And it speaks to, uh, and as I go through the presentation tonight, you, you will see, it just speaks to what um, CTE has, has become or what it has uh, been shown in the past few years, uh, in my opinion. I think that uh, over the years in, in the United States, the, the pendulum in public education swung really far one way in, in the form of, you know, advocating that all students must go to college. And, and now we see the, the, that, you know, college is definitely for um, many students, but college is not for many students. And CTE, now that pendulum is swinging back this way and we're really seeing uh, the value. So these, these statistics here just really point to that and to, to show that how important CTE is and how you know, important it is to students, parents, and to you know, our, our nation. And so I just put together just a, just a few numbers. We could sit here, you know, all night and go over numbers and, and look at it. But just for Queen Anne's County, we have 19 programs between both high schools, 35 CTE teachers, and this data was pulled from uh, the MarylandCTEData.org website. So 1,539 students taking at least one CTE course, and this is from 2021. And in total, 2,914 total CTE courses taken in 2001. And that's at the, that's at the high school level. 
and just a couple quick highlights. There, there were many that we could put in here, but uh, you know, Dr. Salem just mentioned our most recent, which is our governor's citation for the most youth apprentices on the Eastern Shore. And I'll speak to that a little bit more um, as we get into the presentation as it relates to why that is important for the Maryland Blueprint uh, accountability measure. So that was good for us. We started, uh, we were actually, Queen Anne's County was actually the first county on the Eastern Shore to start with the youth apprenticeship program back in 2018. So we've been building, uh, building upon that. Um, and I'll, I'll jump to that last bullet and I'll come back because that, that really, um, you know, also speaks to our partnership with Queen Anne's County Chamber of Commerce, uh, most recently with economic development and the CTE liaison who's Connie Dean and Ms. Dean um, does a tremendous job of going out and meeting businesses and really fulfills that job as liaison and connecting the businesses with the school system. So that was such a much needed part and we are thankful for uh, the county commissioners to put that position in place uh, and, and we are continuing to grow on that. And, and I didn't put that in there. We also have the most businesses uh, as of right now on the Eastern Shore that are youth apprentice sponsors. And, and of course we are we're rebuilding from COVID. We had, um, prior to COVID, we had five youth apprentices, which again was the most on the Eastern Shore. COVID hit and then just kind of, you know, sort of decimated, set our program back, I would say. Um, and we're, we are in the process of rebuilding that now and just, you know, getting the, the word out about, you know, how important apprenticeship is and the value for, for businesses, um, you know, to participate in youth apprenticeship. Second bullet, enrollment in skilled trades. And I thought this was, this was a very significant. Uh, this is my sixth year here. Uh, when I came here, there were some of the programs had some very low enrollment for, for whatever reason. Um, one of the programs was our fire program, which is um, as, a, as a volunteer firefighter near and dear to my heart. That program hadn't run uh, when I got here. And we, uh, that was one of my uh, tasks uh, as it was given to me to get that program back up and running. And it's been running every year since then. And, and coincidentally, that program offers the most um, certifications of any of our programs uh, that we have. So very valuable program doesn't cost, uh, cost a thing for the county. Um, and we're in the process of kind of rebranding that. We've gotten a grant that we're, that we're trying to market a little bit better um, for the students. So we're very, very proud of that. Skilled trades at the high school level, uh, just looking at carpentry, Masonry, welding, we are, we are at capacity, and in some cases over capacity uh, in those programs. Um, automotive the same way. Uh, so <clears throat> again, just, you know, it, I think it's, it speaks to a lot of things, but I really think it speaks back to that, that pendulum that I spoke about and, and that the, the nation and, you know, the state sees the need and we see it now that we, we do not have enough uh, workers to fill the skilled trades and, and uh, it's the, the, those positions, uh, those occupations are just, uh, they're great occupations and we're just getting that message back out to people to let them know that's what it is. And again, that I think our enrollment in those programs really, really speaks to that. So we're, we're very proud of that. Uh, Project Lead the Way. Um, Again, when I came on, we, we had um, two teachers between four, four middle schools, and we have been able to, to procure four teachers now, one teacher for each middle school, which is, which is great. The programs are really good. They feed into our high school programs, engineering, biomedical uh, sciences. Uh, and as we recognized a few months ago, our very own Mr. Rocco Barletta was selected as the, the National Project Either Way Gateway Teacher of the Year, uh, which, is, which is a great accomplishment. So we are super proud of that. Um, our culinary arts program, this is a picture of our, our four youth apprentices that we had uh, with, our, with our partnership with Chesapeake College. That was a um, only program in the state that did what we did, which was partnering with Chesapeake College, where they provided the instruction as we don't currently have our own culinary program. They provided the instruction and then we were able, uh, again, with, with help from the chamber and economic development, to pair those students with businesses and have them actually participate in the youth apprenticeship program. And I'll go over the, you know, the youth apprenticeship program in a second in more detail, but those students uh, were paid to be there and they just learned, you know, invaluable skills. Uh, you know, while they were there, when, when the state superintendent was here, Dr. Salins and I went around with him and, and visited these students, and, and he heard the same thing uh, from all the students, and he asked, you know, jokingly, did, did, we, did we prep them? And, you know, we certainly didn't, but just the value that they got from actually, they, they, the skills that they received at the college, they talked about knife skills and various things, but um, 
they really spoke to the, their, their on-the-job experience that they got from the restaurants, and that was the, that was the highlight of what they talked about. So we we really feel that this this program, youth apprenticeship, is just um, invaluable to students to, to be able to give them the instruction and then put them out in the field where they actually learn uh, hands-on. So we're very proud of that. Hey Adam, before you go on, you told me I can interrupt when we have yes, questions. Um, project lead the way. What's that look like in the middle schools? I mean, are, are they? particular courses or classes that so, they're yeah so they in? they have various courses at the middle school we um we offer uh there's roughly about eight to ten courses that they can take so we try to offer a different course for each so we have computer science we have uh, flight and space which is a new one that we started this year um mr barletta he's been around for a long time he's he's certified to teach all the courses we have automation and robotics design and modeling app creators so it's a it's a, and they, they are designed at the middle school level they can be taken they don't have to be taken in any kind of sequence they can they can be taken at any time so we've kind of structured it so that we try to fit the best with the, with the middle schools so and we again we're trying to add some new things flight and space is a new one for um, we're doing that at Centerville Middle School this year and we're going to try to add some some drones to the program and also to add some drones to our program at Queen Anne County and uh, at Kent Island High School so right and then at the, at the high school level, we, like I said, we have engineering and we also have biomedical science and um, potentially we, we are uh, liking to look at one of their other programs, which is computer integrated manufacturing through Project Lead the Way, which kind of feeds into our um, businesses that we partner with with manufacturing. So we're gonna hopefully bring that in at some point. Yeah, I, I did stop into one of the uh, app classes, app design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, you know, the kids are obviously very much into that. It doesn't take much uh, right. enticement, I think, to to get them to participate, and, and they really look like they're having a good time. They do. Well, they, you stuff. know, it's they, they come to us with with those skills already. You know, they they know those from when the right. when they're very small. They know how to operate electronics, and and so it's really that this really is the, the future for our kids, and and they they fall right into it, and and uh, you know, and many times they can you know do things quicker than than the instructor can just because they are so you know so well versed in it. So we're we're happy to have those in, in all four middle schools. So this gets at Perkins 5. Again, I want to talk about the, the funding just so it's just a, a, a base understanding of this. And Perkins 5 is the, the federal legislation um, that funds career and technology uh, education in uh, the, the United States. And this was, Perkins 5 was reauthorized, was authorized in 2018 um, by President Trump. And it provides the funding, like I said, for all the programs. The funding comes from the federal government to, to the state and then passes down by the state um, to the local jurisdictions. This is, I'm going to, I'll jump, I'm going to jump back to that jump ahead here quickly. So this is, this is the funding calculation. This is actually how the, the, the state calculates how the money comes to us. So basically 30% of all the students in the state, um, that the, those students account for 30% of the funding. 70% of that funding, um, individuals five through 17 who reside in the school district who are from families below the poverty level compared to the total overall enrollment in the district. So that's, that's that funding mechanism. And so then again, I'll jump back to this chart, which it may make a little more sense when you see that as you compare the the student enrollment to the allotment. So when you look at counties that have smaller enrollment but have a higher allotment, that is really based on that 70% funding um, calculation, which are the students that are below the poverty level. Um, these numbers also are numbers that represent um, carryover money from COVID. You know, with all the funding that was out there, uh, that was in MSD as well, they gave carryover money. So our 75,000 really typically looks between 63 and 65. So we haven't seen numbers for next year, which will be fiscal year 24, but we're, I'm mm -hmm. guessing that that will probably be around 63 to 65, so it will be, it will be lower. Talk about the funding real quick. Are the youth apprenticeships, are, are they paid apprenticeships? Yes. 100% mm -hmm. right on. 100%. I guess One question own. I got, and I understand the wealth formula and all that stuff mm -hmm. never works out for us sometimes. But I'm looking at Queen Anne's, 7,000 students, 75,000. Talbot is just as wealthy as we are. They got half the students and got almost as much money as us. 
I, I'm looking. I, 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 I'm trying just to look at this thing and find out. Just, uh, and I'm prejudiced because I'm looking for Queen Anne's County. Sure. <laughs> just looks like we're not getting our fair share of some of these places. Sure. I, I think there's a misperception about Talbot County and its wealth. So it's wealthy in land, but not as it relates to the diversity and the poverty level of their students. It's very similar to actually Caroline County. So it, it, it's, perce it's perceived, you know, the perception from those outside of Talbot County is that it's a wealthy district, but it's a lot of old money. It's all land because it's waterfront. So I think they're more rich in their property value as opposed to that doesn't take, you know, you have to think about the diversity of their actual student body. And that diversity is very similar to Caroline County. Per capita income, right? Family income, medium. So it's not based on what we get, like, because when we get funding from the state, Tall and us are pretty close. Gotcha. As far as wealth, I, I think this set that that seventy percent calculation there, where it's the students that are below poverty level, I think that's where they are more similar to Caroline than they would be to us. And Kent County, same thing. I mean, I mean, I'm not. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. But and that you know, due to their low lower enrollment and the, the fewer programs that they have in Kent County, so all that kind of factors in. And again, that that carryover number that that is there for COVID was sort of an outlier and, and it, that will not be there next year. So those numbers will, will kind of be readjusted to as closer to real numbers as they should be. Okay. But in general, this is, this is diverse, pretty true. No. Right? Yeah. No. So it, it does make it tough and, and you know, we've had these conversations many times um, because it costs just as much to run an automotive program in Queen Anne's County as it does in Talbot and Wicomico and Worcester. So uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, we actually had a meeting a, a couple years ago with Senator Cardin and, and told him the same thing is that, you know, we, we need more money to run the programs and, and um, you know, to kind of readjust those numbers. but. Uh, hasn't happened yet, but we, we try to do the best we can with what we have. Good question with the youth apprenticeship. So we have people who, uh, businesses who are doing um, automotive and we're getting the apprentice. Do, have we reached out to the businesses to help them fund that particular program that they uh, have apprentices with? So I'll, I'll skip right down to, um, well, I'll jump down, then I'll, I'll come back. So we don't provide any funding to them. So the businesses actually have to apply to the Maryland Department of Labor to become a youth apprenticeship business. Uh, when it first started out, it was kind of a, a cumbersome process, um, and many businesses didn't, you know, it was one more thing that was added on, you know, with, and they didn't want to do it, limited staff, whatever the reason. Um, they really narrowed that and simplified that application process down to really a one-page application, and they just apply with the, the uh, Maryland Department of Labor. Maryland Department of Labor has a um, youth apprenticeship navigator for the, he, he, he has a big job, he does the entire Eastern Shore, so when a business applies, um, he would go out and look at the business to make sure that it's a, a suitable business to, to place students in safe um, and that they are in good standing with the Department of Labor. Then they take it to, um, they have a youth apprenticeship, I know it's probably a different name, but youth apprenticeship council basically for uh, Maryland Department of Labor. They approve them and then um, basically the business would then put out an application just as they would for a normal position. We would advertise it as a school system and the students would work through their school council or to apply for this, you know, for the position. And then it kind of falls out of our hands in terms of they, they actually apply and interview with the business directly and the business would select them for, for the position. So it's not us doing it, it's, it's an actual interview. I guess I was thinking, you know, I, I think recently we needed some piece of equipment for them to be able to stay A certified in our, so we needed that money for mm -hmm. that piece of equipment. Do we ask our business partners to help fund those types of things. In in some cases, and, and in some cases, in in that particular case, it it's difficult because we have to have the 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 current technology. There are some in in order to to maintain and to qualify for the certification. There are some businesses that have donated equipment to us that doesn't matter if it if it is you know the most up to date. But in order to certify students, because cert, you know the students certify in certain areas, it has to be they're certifying on up to date equipment. But but absolutely. And so I'll try to tie this back in with um, with youth apprenticeship, and <laughs> you, you all have heard much about the Maryland's blueprint for the future. Um, this is the accountability piece as it relates to CTE. So by 2030, 
45% of high school graduates will earn an industry credential or complete a registered youth apprenticeship. <clears throat> the measure before Blueprint came along had one more piece in here, and that was complete a uh, CTE pathway. So they had three measures versus two. When that third measure was in there, m most, I won't say most, many districts were meeting that goal. We were hitting that goal between 46 to 49% every year because of the completion piece in there, students that actually complete a CTE pathway. This has been removed, the, the data was run by MSDE last year, and so if they you know, took a snapshot then, of the districts in the state of Maryland, only 7% would have met that accountability measure. Um, if we, I looked at our data uh, as it was in 2021, again, a little weird with, with COVID and, and probably not as quite as accurate as it uh, had been in the past, but we were probably about nine to 10% there. Um, so we do, and all districts, um, you know, have some work to do to get to this, but it does, again, it, you know, like I said before, it speaks to the importance of the youth apprenticeship and, and building this out and getting more businesses involved and, and educating them on that. Uh, and again, also, you know, having students earn industry credential. And, and this year we are on track to, to probably double the number of certifications that we had for last year. Again, recovering from COVID, whatever reason, you know, we have higher enrollment this year and we're offering more certifications in our program. So we're going to increase there. We're trying to increase in youth apprenticeship. 2030 seems like a, a long way away, but we'll be hitting 23 here, you know, in another month. So um, not not too far away, but we're working toward it. We it, it's going to be a lot tougher for the bigger districts to, to meet this. And, and um, I won't say impossible to meet it, but it's going to be a, a very difficult task, but. Um, just a quick question. When we're talking about substitutes, have we looked at <clears throat> using an industry provider as a substitute for some of these CTE classes. I know that um, for a period of time, our one teacher was out for a while. Were we looking at someone in that industry to come in and help substitute so that the kids could continue to get the training that they needed so they could get to their certification? Is that something that we could think about, maybe? <coughs> We could consider that they would have to go through the application and the in the onboarding process that we have in order to partnership with us. Okay. And you know, I won't read through these. I just put the definitions in there just to, to show what what they actually are. Uh, many times, and and I was terribly guilty of this when I first started and came on. Um, okay. You know, sometimes we use the terms internship, work-based learning, apprenticeship interchangeably, but, but in this, you know, in this circumstance, um, apprenticeship is that definition, a registered apprenticeship that is recognized by the Maryland Department of Labor. Um, and so we do have students that do internships, you know, work-based learning, um, but the blueprint does not, will not count them toward this 45% unless it's an actual registered youth apprenticeship. So. And this, these are just, you know, the, just the overall requirements for youth apprenticeship, 16 years old. Uh, they can do the related instruction in a various, you know, various ways they can do it at our, at our school. The culinary students that we talked about, they did the related instruction at, uh, at uh, Chesapeake College. We had a student at Dixon Valve a few years ago. They did the related instruction at Dixon Valve because we didn't have, we don't have a manufacturing uh, program. Uh, then they go out and they are paid, you know, they have to be paid for these hours at least minimum wage. So, so again, it's, it's, um, it is great there. It's, it's, there are some you know, difficulties with it. Like I mentioned, we have businesses that, um, as we all know, are struggling to find employees. So, th so their capacity in many cases is limited to be able to bring a, a young person on. And one of the requirements is that they have to have a mentor for the student, which we, we want them to have a mentor. So they guide that student through the, the process. But again, in many cases, they, they don't have the capacity to do it. Not they don't want to do it. Um, they just don't have the capacity. So we, we are continuously working on this. Um, we had um, a youth apprenticeship uh, sort of informational meeting during youth apprenticeship week, which is when we got the citation that um, the Department of um, Economic Development set up and we had several businesses there, several businesses that we hadn't met with before. So we're, we're trying to spread the word and we're gonna continue to, to push it out there so we can, and it's not just it's not just to meet an accountability measure in Maryland Blueprint. You know, we, we really feel that this is a, a great you know, opportunity for kids. And like I mentioned, to get those kids out and that, that true um, on the job experiences, it's invaluable, so. 
Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. I know it's a lot and, and, and there's probably more to cover, but I just wanted to give the, the, the big pieces there. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, and thank you all for your support. All right, next on the list is 6.02 policy calendar update. Back again. <laughs> Good evening again, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team, Dr. Matthew Kibler, Director of Accountability and Implementation. I wanted to come tonight to give a little update um, on the policy calendar and where we're going with uh, reviewing policies for the district. It's just a little bit of background. You might recall um, last spring, you all approved a, a revision edit to policy on policies. In April, we rescinded 20 policies, and that left us with around 162 policies and regulations that are currently um, on the books. And that breakdown, I don't have the actual breakdown, it's probably somewhere between 100 and 110 policies, and then accompanying regulations make up the balance of that 162 number. Uh, one thing we've done, uh, excuse me, with the, um, with the policy on policies, so policies need to re be reviewed at least once every four years, if not more, depending on if the policy calls it. We do have a handful of policies that are to be um, reviewed annually or every three years, every two years. Uh, one thing that we have not had is basically that four-year calendar rotation. So that's what we're working to create with those 162 policies and regulations. Um, what I've done with the executive team is divided the policies up sort of by area and ask basically to, to evenly space the policies over the next four years so that we don't have to go through 162 policies and regulations in this first year of the calendar, that we can evenly space this out. So we first did that. And now with all the policies that we have for the 22-23 year, what I've asked those groups to do is label each of the policies that are in this first year as either they don't need any changes, so they would just come to you to basically be reaffirmed. Uh, do they need reformatted? We have some policies dating back to 1993 that are in an old format, so we'd like to get those in the current format we've had for, um, for policies. Do they need edits, so do they need wholesale changes? Um, or should, do we have additional policies that can be removed or, or rescinded? There, there are a handful that fall into that. Maybe they're covered by um, one of the contracts. Maybe they can fit nicely into another policy, something like that. Um, so starting next year, or excuse me, starting in January, we're gonna start bringing the policies that need to be edited because they'll have to go through the three reads. Um, we do have about 20 of them that we'll have to do for this year. Starting in January, uh, Ms. Towers has, has volunteered to go first with some fi finance policies. She'll be up first on the docket there for the first read. In February, I'd like to bring the policies um, that need to be rescinded and the policies that don't need any changes. Removing, we're gonna recommend three. Um, the reformatted, it's about six. And then, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I said the wrong thing. Policies to rescind, we have three to recommend. Policies that don't need any changes, we don't think there are 10. And then in March, bringing policies that need to be reformatted, there are six. The reason to kind of front load those, those changes, it would still give us time if you all want to make a change that we could get our three reads in before the next fiscal year. Um, and then I did miss the last step there. One thing that the policy on policy says as well, as we go through these policy revisions, edits, changes, uh, rescinding, the CAC, the Citizens Advisory Council, and the School System Improvement Committee will be a part, um, have their chance to get input um, with those policies as well. 
So bringing those up in the January, February, March, it's, it's when we're still dealing with um, when the CAC and SSIC will still be meeting so they can do that. This does not mean we won't get an emergency policy in June from MSDE that we have to bring forward that we weren't scheduled for. The CAC and SSIC know we might call a special meeting to look at a, um, to look at a policy, maybe over Zoom or something like that. But um, that's where we're going with the policies. I did want to give an update then on the Citizens Advisory Council as well, but before I do that, I don't know if anybody has any questions on the policies right now. Sounds like you're going in the right direction, so. Try. It's, yeah, it's a lot to <laughs> triage there and everything else, so thanks. Yeah, so hopefully in four years we'll get through the whole cycle and, and <laughs> I'm trying to build something. I think, you know, changing leadership over the last five to 10 years, it's a hard, hard project, so hopefully we're building something that is sustainable for years to come with that. Uh, with the Citizens Advisory Council, if, if it's okay, uh, we did have our second meeting in, on November 9th. They are engaged and ready ready to help in any in any way that they can. Uh, in November, we um, they had requested um, sort of an update on buildings and ca capital projects. So I got some great information from Mr. <coughs> Pender, who talked about capital improvements and projects, how we monitor the status of the buildings, how projects are are um, prioritized and we also started working on the school calendar for next year our third meeting is is next week on december 14th we'll continue working on the school calendar so i, I got some good feedback at that first meeting so I, I proposed one draft to them which was kind of a mirror of this year's calendar and they gave some good feedback so now we have i have three drafts to share with them based on their feedback uh, make a couple edits and the goal is to bring those three calendars for you all to look at at the January, I believe it's the 18th um, work session. Um, also at next week's meeting, uh, Mr. Joe Sabori, our new coordinator of school safety and security, he'll be giving a talk, uh, just updates on what we're doing for school safety. Um, and then we have our three spring meeting, in-person spring meeting dates, uh, the fourth Wednesday of the month in January, February, and April. I think February is actually in the fourth week, but on Tuesday because of a conflict with our budget meetings, probably, if we approve mm -hmm. that a little later. And were they planning to uh, send a representative to the one of the board meetings upcoming to just give a brief on what they're doing or? That, is, other... that can be at your discretion. What I told them f for the, you know, for the beginning stages here was that I could kind of deliver the, deliver the message. If there was something you'd prefer to hear from them, I'm happy to ask, um, but that that's completely up to you. So if you would prefer one of them coming and giving these updates, that's fine. Um, but right now, kind of facilitating them this way. Yeah, no, that's great. And I know you're just getting off the ground, you sure. know, flying. Um, but I think from time to time, if the board may have some issues that we'd like the CAC to take up and, and consider. Um, th that's something that would they and they're be ready able to and do right if, if it's in their area. Of and, and they're ready and willing to do that. I, I did say for something like the calendar right now. Hopefully they didn't think me bringing their opinion on they like option C best isn't too controversial. But but maybe we get into something in the spring. And and I and I might prefer that one of them come as well. Yeah, um, hey, it's all important. Calendar and sure. everything else. All the input, the better. Sure. One thing I'd like to see, and the calendar is always a tricky thing. I like to start late and finish early, but there's so many days you got to put in that that bowl. I'd like to consider talking to the election board about uh, using our schools as voting places. I think that was a problem last year. Both uh, I heard it at one meeting at a security issue when we had early voting. Um, also, um, we do have a lot of firehouses and other places. It is not the privy of the county commissioners. It's the election board. And I would just think that would be one day, not next year, but the following year we do the 24 year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to, mm -hmm. if the board could get a consensus on that to uh, ask that we could uh, not have our schools be used because I think election day could be where we could be in school. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I was at Churchill when that happened and that was a huge safety concern. So that would definitely be a good idea. Yeah. And I don't know if that, you know, make recommendations. Board can certainly send it out if they want to. Mark could get with that. Uh, mm -hmm. When do we think it's most appropriate to start that conversation? Is it is it probably now? now. Um, probably, probably yes. The, yeah, the conversation I've had. Probably now. It's not the commissioners. They. It's it's an election 
issue, but there's a county election board with their attorney. Um, I would just think that either the board initiates it or CAC initiates it or whoever, Dr. Sillins, and, you know, with support, I'd hope the board would get it, um, but that we'd uh, do that, because I just think it's a day that we can recoup, not, not lose. Yeah, I think that might be more for the board to, you know, take up an address okay. than the, the CAC, at least at this point. You know, that's ultimately our responsibility, what goes on in the schools when. So, but it's anybody done, else? It doesn't, it doesn't affect this calendar, but it will affect the, mm -hmm. the following right. one. Yeah. And I know how much we went through last time trying to get snow days in and, you know, every once in a while Mr. Pinder could pull a fog day on us and, you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> he controls it. He controls fog. I know he does. Uh -huh. Yeah, we are trying. I mean, the, the goal here, bringing this in January, get it get it out a little bit mm -hmm. earlier than um, and, and maybe even earlier still next year as well. Now that we have like CAC up and running and we'll get up, get our first meeting off the ground a little quicker next year as well. So I, I'm happy to take any other questions on the policies or the CAC if anybody has them. None. Matt, thanks again. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> This tower is 6.03, ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 breakdown. Mm -hmm. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. My name is Jane Towers, CFO. Tonight we bring before you for a review or information is our ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 spend. ESSER 2 is going to be ending towards the end of September and all that's remaining is some money set aside for instructional material and operating supplies. So we're on track to spend that out. September of 23. Oh, yes. So is this going to be our, this, is it still paying for summer school this time around? It, um, this past summer school was it, and it was under ESSER 3. So okay. uh, ESSER 3 was the one that paid for this past summer school. So that's ESSER 2. I don't and have then, a lot of questions, but all this ESSER okay. money, you know, when it starts going away, it's funding a lot of programs and positions we have currently, and it's going to be something that's going to be, I think this spring or this January, February, we do our budget, it's going to be some things we have to address very, very closely. Correct. For um, 22, we already started weaving in some of those back into the operating budget. Mm -hmm. We were able to um, repurpose positions, nine and a half positions, take a look at some instructional uh, assessment programs that we were able to bring in. And then again, in this budget cycle, we'll be mindful of that too as well. And then the next one we bring before you is ESSER 3. As a reminder, that ends 9-30-24. And we're on track to spend that out as per the grant allocation there. Any questions? All right. You're up again, expenditure. So, um, Tonight we bring before you, ending November 23, your expenditure status report, in summary, as well as in detail. And not that we, don't, not that we don't bring this up all the time when we talk to the commissioners and everybody else, but fuel cost. That is a huge I mean, especially concern. with our transportation, is, is a, it's, it it's something that's... Yes, it averages about 100000 over each month now. Budget. Over budget, correct, for fuel costs. You might be seeing me again sometime soon about uh -huh. that. You might be seeing me again sometime soon about a budget amendment for that. This is some of these that are already in the 90, over the 90 percent, or is that just normal? I'm like the health the students health services is already at 94th percent right with the student health services let me take a look a majority of that is salaries and most of it is encumbered all but 64,000 so that's um, salaries are a little over 1 million the total budget is almost 1.1 1 .1, so there's not much other wiggle room in that area so that's why you see the 93 but nothing concerning in that form we, like, like, that's a good question, but when we have 90, 95% spent, it's not really spent yeah, yet. It's, it's just encumbered. allocated, encumbered to the to the contract or whatever. And that's a very good point. So it, 
when you look at the columns here, you have the budget amount, the period expenditures, which means in that current month. The next column is encumbrances outstanding, so that takes us out to the end of the year. That it's set aside. The salaries are um, technically reserved to the end of the year. Year to date is actually what's been paid to. Um, either employees or the line item in particular, what's available, and then that percentage then. Thank you. All right, yep. Thank you, Mrs. Towers. So next uh, is break. Do we want to take a break or we want to keep pushing through? Then we push through. Keep going. Ellen says we push through. Let's right. go. <laughs> okay. 8.01, Human Resources and Substitute Bus Driver Reports. I make a motion we uh, discuss that at personnel in closed session. Um, I make a motion we approve uh, HR report. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 8.02, Synergistic Contract Approval. President uh, Schifanelli, board members, Dr. Salins, executive team, for the record. My name's uh, Sid Pinder, chief operating officer, and next to me is um, Mary Ellen Leader, who's the regional vice president uh, of client development for uh, Synergistics. And sitting behind us is uh, Mr. Lynn Pace. He is the senior vice president of strategic initiatives for uh, Synergistics. Um, before you tonight, I'm seeking approval of a service agreement with Synergistics LSC for delivering comprehensive energy uh, conservation and management services to include behavioral changes, staff training, technology to um, assess ventilation and filtration conditions, along with optimizing the existing HVAC systems, lighting, mechanical equipment, and EMS controls. Um, basically, we'll have a little short five minute presentation um, that we have put together. You're gonna to answer probably a lot of the questions that you have. Um, this is a program that we actually did many years ago and it's, I started out with this. Um, back then it was called Energy Education Incorporated. And we went through a five year cycle. And we actually reduced um, the amount of energy consumption. Uh, it was about 28%. Um, and when I say that, it ended up being about 1.8 million over those you know, five, five years. Um, the concept behind this is basically it's self-efficient. So you're gonna, through the savings, you're gonna pay off the uh, annual fee um, through Synergistics. With that, um, we hire an energy specialist, um, which I, I held that same position. And basically you're auditing the buildings at nighttime um, and you're on the weekends. You're looking at the energy bills and analyzing them. You're putting it all into a data management system. And this really ties in well, I didn't put it in here, but, um, House Bill um, 630 that was passed last year basically is also requiring tighter tracking of your energy, what kind of reductions that you're gonna put in place, how you're gonna accomplish that, and this, this program will help us out with that. Um, basically, the energy specialist would monitor the, uh, the EMS, and I can tell you, as I took on different hats, this is something that kind of fell by the wayside of programming at nighttime. Like basically our schools, you're looking at somebody that goes in there and programs 14 different schools for all the different areas in the evenings to make sure that the air conditioning is running or the heat's running for the Christmas program, for the uh, basketball events, all kinds of athletic events. But then you gotta remember, all right, did I take it out of there? Or is it running, still running 24 seven and making changes to the system? Um, th that's a huge part of this, of, of tracking that and doing the EMS system. And we have four different systems within our 14 buildings. So it's not under one, one system. Um, uh, Synergistics uh, LLC will provide us a cloud-based energy management platform that will track utility usage by meter um, through dollars and also consumption and measure the energy savings. 
Um, one of the other features that is critical here, we can actually do simulations on this new program to go through and say, okay, we want to shut down um, CPOD at Centerville Middle School for the summertime. What kind of implications is that going to have on that building? Um, yes, we may save money, but is it in the best interest of the air quality um, or energy management systems? This is a, um, it's again self funded. If we don't save the amount indicated, Synergistics will write us a check back for that. Um, and so it's self supporting. And I don't want to kind of take away from your show. I just wanted to give a little up to date on it. So no, you did you did a great Sorry. job. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I've got a couple of short slides to address kind of a, a little bit more detail of what Mr. Pinder just explained. But please stop me at any point for questions. You know, we'd like this to be a dialogue as we go through. Um, so, as Mr. Pinder mentioned, you know, we, the Synergistic has been around for over 36 years and we did work in the district in the past. Uh, the highlighted area there I like to point out because we're bringing with us not just an energy specialist who we hire and who is dedicated to this district, to your buildings, to your students, to your administration, um, but we're also bringing um, subject matter experts that will be on call for whatever needs you have. Our goal is to optimize the equipment that you have. We don't require that you buy anything new. We don't require that you upgrade the equipment. We work with what you have to optimize it. Should you decide to make any additions, that's fine. We can be a, uh, a vendor neutral resource for you, but we back out any of those energy savings from what we report because that would be directly related to your capital investments. Uh, it's a holistic approach. We're looking at everything from irrigation systems to boilers and everything in between. Um, so we're looking at all areas. And as mentioned, this, the energy specialists would spend about 60% of their time during off hours when the buildings are empty. So nights, weekends, breaks, making sure that the buildings are set back and not using energy when there's no need for it. Um, we'll never compromise the uh, learning environment while the students are in the buildings. That is our, our priority for the students and the faculty and administration. So it's those off hours where there's the greatest opportunity to make sure that the equipment is running efficiently, extending the life of it, and that it's not running needlessly during those off hours. So we have a unique um, approach where we have patented technology that we bring to bear. So um, the energy specialist is going to be running audits using this technology as they walk through the buildings. It's very easy to track it because everything is real time. Anybody can access it on their smartphone or on their computer, uh, at their you know laptop computer. Um, but there is this one energy specialist that, that's dedicated to your schools, to your students. We hire them, we train them. They're an extension of your team. So you're involved in the hiring of them from a culture standpoint. We want to make sure that they'll fit in and you know be the face of the program and interacting with the, with the uh, faculty and administration. Um, but we will uh, identify that person with your input. You said that they, there's an app that <clears throat> anybody can access. It's a controlled access, correct? Yeah, when I say anybody, I mean those who you deem. Gotcha. <laughs> Just yeah. want to make sure. <laughs> yeah, it's not free for all kind of a thing. Um, there are uh, four components of the technology. Um, I Green X is the app that the energy specialist would use to report those uh, audits that they're doing. Simulate is um, what was mentioned where if you want to take a look and see, um, you know, what would be the best location for summer school. Lots of factors come into play, but from a purely environmental standpoint, it might drive some decisions. Also, if you're renting space out to church groups or other organizations, community organizations, which location is the best spot for that? And how much would you charge for that to cover the costs? So a lot of times people tell us, well, we have this old price list, but we really don't know if we're covering our costs. It gives you some science to put behind it. Another great feature of Simulate is that if you say perhaps there's a, a lighting retrofit or a new roof or windows, what's the ROI on those projects? So it helps you make decisions of how you're going to spend your money, should you have money to spend on those projects. Again, not required to, to spend anything from our standpoint, but our tools will help you make those decisions. 
And then measure is the measurement and verification tool which shows you what energy reduction took place. So we'll establish a baseline, we'll measure against that baseline, and it's, it's a very straight accounting procedure um, so that you can see this is what we spent in the energy, you know, whatever category last year, this is what we spent this year, the difference is your savings. When you say spent, you'll probably use units because, I mean, it's 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 not a fair apples and apples when you deal with, like, fuel oil could be $3 right. or $5. Right. So We're looking at a 12-month running average for the cost of okay. the energy source. Exactly. Thank you. So um, up on the screen is the estimated savings. The top line is the projected gross savings um, and the projected net savings after the program investment is we're, we, we're looking at approximately $2.2 .2 million over the course of five years. And again, these are estimates because we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but based on our 36 years of experience, uh, benchmarking the data that we received from, the, from uh, the team here and looking at how it compares to others in the region, uh, we tend to under-promise and over-deliver. And as Mr. Pinder said, the program investment line is guaranteed in our contract. You will never spend more than you save. And even at that break-even point, you still had the benefit of the energy specialist and that team of experts that have been coming in and out of your buildings, working on your equipment, training the staff to whatever degree you'd like. We can spend time with the existing team to help build that institutional knowledge as well. So you're still got, you've still got all of those things ahead even if you come to that break-even point. Um, I think the, the, the last thing I wanted to highlight on this slide is the synergistic community, which is the education component. So that ties in where we have curriculum available, again, for your use at, at your discretion, however much you want, want. But each month there's a theme and it's uh, age appropriate. So it might be a three, grade three through five uh, activity cards, for example. Oftentimes an energy specialist will go in and co-teach a class. So, you know, you're focusing on those STEAM, uh, components, you know, to get the kids involved, uh, perhaps re-energizing some um, energy clubs. Um, and then there's also the, the carryover to home, right? So instead of parents telling the kids to turn off the lights, now the kids are reminding parents to turn off the lights mm -hmm. or to unplug equipment and, you know, phantom energy and that kind of thing. So it, it comes full circle. We also have a communications team that will help write press releases, give you um, sound bites to put on your social media feeds so that you can keep the community informed as well. Um, and, you know, these days the kids are quite into it. So they, they're enthusiastic and, you know, they want to save the planet because it's theirs to, to take on down the road. Um, this last slide just highlights a couple of um, uh, references that we shared with the team here, um, you know, do, doing their due diligence to talk to their counterparts in different places. Um, I don't have them up here because they're a, a new client as of July, but Caroline County started with us on July 1st. And they're off to a really terrific start. Um, they're, they're sort of being held up as the poster child for success because they got off and running on a great start. And um, again, it's just since July, but they already have good numbers in terms of their savings and building you know, month over month in terms of what they're accomplishing. Um, so they're, they're a local reference that you know, uh, everybody is familiar with and has reached out to as well. So any questions that I could answer? Well, it almost sounds too good to be true, <laughs> but I say almost because you do have a proven track record, and it's yeah. certainly needed at this particular time, uh, especially. And so I just wanted to comment, but if I could I, add, yeah, go ahead. So. Caroline County went through the same procedures say, yeah, that we, we did. They had did this many years ago, and then people take on different hats, yep. and it's something that falls by the wayside. But it's something you can <clears> control. You know what I mean? There's not many things we can control, but we can control the usage. Mm -hmm. And then one other thing I wanted to add, you were asking about apples to apples. So people used to say to me, well, hey, uh, it was a warm winter. You should have saved money. Well, yeah, we did. But it's also based upon how many heating degree days you were using. So all of a sudden I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, we saved money, but I'm in the red because I should have did better than what I was doing. You know, so it's... And everything that I did was by paper. This is a, a whole different ball game with the software. Sorry. Oh, no. uh, you said uh, it doesn't require any new hardware unless the schools choose to go with something like that. 
Um, is there, do you guys ever work with any kind of SCADA systems where a person could control all the schools remotely from one location? We do. Okay. So yeah, our EMS controls, um, out of the 14 schools, uh, myself and two other individuals can be anywhere as long as I have internet connection. Um, out of 12 of those schools, I can control. Um, we still have two that we actually have to physically go to our um, maintenance shop to, to program. But yeah, I can sit in my house on a snow day and go boom, boom, boom. Now it's gonna take me two or three, I mean, it's gonna take a while to get there, but I can do all that from home as long as I have internet connection. Okay. Yep. I like the idea that you can put a cost on what it, like for extracurricular activities, you know, we rent our buildings out, they use them. And we get, we'll have a figure, a, a, a good figure to say, look, you know, where you, you can use our building, but it's, it's costing us $300 an hour to, to keep this because we would be turning it down rather than turning it up. I think, that, I think it's both on good parties because it's a good business plan to say, look, this is what it costs. This is what we need. The other thing, will it tell, like, we build these schools and they're environmentally friendly. They're green. They have this, they have that, but they all use that. Will it tell us which ones are more effective? Because, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Some people have this certain kind of things that I don't know really if they're saving any money or not, especially what it costs. You know, if you spend $10,000 to save four, that's not a good deal to me. You know, and I just, you know, it's like a light bulb in your house. You get one of these LEDs, but if it costs you $5 for the bulb and you're going to save it over 10 years, right. I used a regular light. Good. That's a great question. So the executive app gives you the ability to rank your schools. And we understand, you know, the rankings aren't always right. black and white, you know, because of different variables. But what's the, the highest ranking school doing that other schools could do as well? So it gives you the ability to look at all of your elementary schools, compare the two high schools, you know, different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes our districts will, um, you know, do a little competition among the, the principals. Everybody wants to win, so it might be a nice pop party for the kids or a slush fund to fix something that needs to be fixed at their particular building. So there's lots of ways to use the data to motivate and to get the buy-in. Um, but yes, we can, we can look at that and, you know, kind of rank the schools and take all of those things into consideration. We've, we've talked about this before, so it's, it's a very exciting and... and um yeah, it's almost too good to be true, but it's very exciting. I mean, it seems like no risk. But I just had a question, and I'm not questioning in a negative way. I'm just wondering the cost of the program each year. What is the, what the increase being 20, 30, 40, yep. 50, 50,000? That, that's, that's a good question. So the way that the price, and I'll just flip back to that slide. The way that the pricing is structured, it's a flat fee, uh, a flat amount over the course of the 60 months. But we discount our fee at the beginning of the program so that you can realize your savings sooner. So we're putting a lot of, you know, people and uh, effort into the program, but we want you to start to see those savings more quickly. So we don't typically break even on our side until about 18 to 24 months into the program, but we do that intentionally, you know, for those reasons. So, you know, the alternative is we could do a flat fee over the 60 months if, you know, you prefer that, but this gives that flexibility to see those savings kick in. Thanks. Sure. Okay, any other questions? So, 8.02, synergistic contract approval. Do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. President, I move that we accept the, I'm sorry, I'm going to move up here, the synergenic, synergistic LLC service agreement in the, uh, well, there's no, it's budgeted, there's no impact, but I guess it's the 248,000, 350,000 uh, second year, 414,996 third year, 483 for the fourth year, and 545, and $4 on the fifth year. Um, budget source savings from fiscal year 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28 budgets. We have a motion, second. 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 All right, we have all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. <clears throat> okay, 8.03, new course approval. I suppose that's Mr. Bell. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, members of the board, executive team. 
For the record, my name is Michael Bell, Supervisor of Visual and Performing Arts, World Languages, and School Library Media for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Tonight, I'm donning my Performing Arts Supervisor hat to gain board approval for two new high school courses in music entitled Guitar Musicianship 2 and Piano Musicianship 2. Anytime we offer a new course of study by law, we are required to present that course to the board for the board's approval so that these courses may be included in our high school program of study with their course descriptions so we can have an articulation with high school principals, academic deans, and school counselors to plan for the upcoming school year. This also allows us to keep students informed that these courses would, with approval, be available to take. With that said, there are no budget or staffing implications for these courses. Students currently in Guitar One or Piano One would simply continue on using the resources we currently have in place at both of those high schools. Any questions? And I heard you say both these high schools, so it's being offered at both schools. At both schools, correct. Because we do have guitar and piano going at both schools right now. So we've generated an interest and it's on the, on the rise and both teachers at those schools really wanted us to have this, so. Unless we Great. musicianship one. Yes, <laughs> correct. Mr. President, I move to approve to implement guitar musicianship two and piano musicianship two for a credit course for the 2023-2024 program of study, fiscal impact, zero dollars. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Oh, no, don't go anywhere. We got 8.04, right? No, that we did both. both. Oh, we did both. I'm sorry. Overnight trip. Okay. You thank you very much. Right. You may be. Uh, thank relieved. you. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs> you too. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bell. All right. Overnight trip approval. Of Queen Anne's County High School girls varsity basketball. Yes, uh, good evening again. Um, I am seeking approval for the Queen Anne's County girls basketball uh, team, varsity basketball team to travel to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, um, located in Princeton, Anne, Maryland, and also the Civic Center in Salisbury, Maryland to compete in the um, 2022 Governor's Basketball Challenge Tournament. For those of you who do not know, that's the largest tournament in the nation for high school students. Um, this is a um, tournament that will take place on December 26. Um, when they will depart from Queens County High School and then they will return on December 27th. Um, you can see where the times are. They will be taking a school bus and they've also provided a, uh, a room for the school bus driver and paying for his meals also while, while they're down there. There's approximately uh, 10 to 12 students um, with three staff members that will be attending. Um, one of those, yes, is a female um, coach, um, you know, that will be attending with that. Um, all expenses are paid for from the girls basketball account. This is a trip that they have performed in the past um, prior to COVID. And as you will see with a couple of the others, things are kind of coming back to normal and the students are getting to experience those, you know, tournaments and trips. There, um, there's no uh, substitute uh, impact fees or anything like that. Again, all of the uh, budgeted items are covered by the um, girls varsity basketball team. It's about $770. And I'm sure some of the parents will be going there too? Of course. Uh, oh. I, I, will, <laughs> I have two daughters, so yes, I will be. Just, just checking. <laughs> exactly. What are our chances? Well, pretty good, pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Mr. President, I move that we uh, approve the overnight trip for the Queen Anne's County High School girls varsity basketball team to travel to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, located in Princess Anne, Maryland, in the Civic Center in Salisbury, to compete in the 2022 Governor's Basketball Challenge Tournament, cost of 770 to be paid from team fundraising. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, Mr. Pender. Um, back again. Yes. Uh, good evening. Tonight I'm seeking um, approval for a trip for the Ken Allen High School wrestling team to travel to Stephen Decatur High School located in Berlin, Maryland to compete in the 2023 War on the Shore wrestling tournament. Um, they would uh, depart on uh, January 13th um, and return on January 14th. Transportation would be through um, one of our school buses again. 
Um, it's about 16 to 18 students, and we have two staff members slash teachers that will be attending. All of the uh, rooms and all the fees are paid for by the uh, Ken Allen High School wrestling team. It's about $715. There's no staffing implication for substitutes. Um, again, this is a trip that prior to COVID, they've always attended um, and they're seeking approval tonight for that. President, I move that we approve the overnight trip for the Ken Island High School wrestling team to travel to Stephen Decatur High School in Berlin to compete in the 2023 War on the Shore wrestling tournament in the amount of $714.98 to be paid for from team fundraising. Second. No discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> okay. I guess this is you again, right? Queen Anne's that Bus Lines LLC, new uh, used bus purchase, number one. Yes, sir. Um, seeking approval tonight for uh, Ms. Robin Finch of the Queen Anne's, County, uh, Queen Anne's Bus Line LLC to purchase a new or used bus for the 23-24 school year um, to replace bus 2110. Um, as you know, <clears throat> we can get up to 15 years um, out of a bus if they start experiencing uh, any kind of difficulties between 12 to 15, you know, we do allow them to purchase a new bus, which will come with a new PVA, which is about $22,000, $23,000 for that PVA. I will say some of these are coming in a little bit early, but we ordered buses seven months ago, and we will finally get to see the two buses that we ordered come in mid-January is what the target is. So the uh, manufacturing and the delivery of them are way behind schedule. Hmm. But since these buses aren't at 15, if they didn't come in by we're next still, fall, we're, we're still, still good. Fine, yep. Mr. President, I move that we approve Robin Finch of the Queen Anne's Bus Lines LLC to approve its purchase of a new used bus to replace number 2110. <laughs> fiscal impact is approximately $23,000 uh, from budget source, fiscal year 24 operating budget. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 And Mr. Bender. Yes, sir. Um, seeking approval tonight for Ms. Jennifer Mansfield of the Queen Anne's Bus Lines <coughs> LLC to purchase a new or used bus for the 23-24 school year to replace bus 5010. Um, again, this bus falls within the same category as the one I was just describing. Um, it will be associated with a new PVA, um, roughly $23,000. Mr. President, I move that we approve Jennifer Mansfield of Queen Anne's Bus Lines LLC to purchase a new or used bus for the 2023-24 school year to replace number 5010. Budget amount approximately $23,000 to be paid for of the fiscal year 24 operating budget. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Yeah, thank you, yes, Mr. Pender. Um, all right, we're up to 8.09, fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget calendar. Certain action on that. I could take a break. <laughs> Wait for some action. Good evening. Okay. Tonight we bring before you the proposed budget calendar for fiscal year 23-24. Items of note: <clears throat> We're in December. We're hearing budget requests from the schools and different departments, and looking in January at two budget work sessions on the 11th and 18th, and then in February on the 8th and 22nd, with the uh, superintendent presenting to the board on March 1st for approval. And then once approved by the board, it would go to the commissioners sometime in April or May, depending on their schedule for final approval there. Mr. President, I move that we accept Ms. Towers' uh, proposed budget calendar for fiscal year 23-24 budget. Second. All right, motion to second. Any discussion, questions? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I think the last one for me, I'm thinking, um, is tonight we bring before you the ESMEC Healthcare Trust Alliance 
We're looking for board approval on a, the teacher slash employee representative. We've had an employee who has um, left the district, which left that position open. So tonight we bring before you Mary Meeham to recommend her to sit on the ESMEC Healthcare Alliance board. Mr. President, I recommend that we approve Mary Meehan as the board appointed teacher employee representative of the Ethnic Health Trust Alliance. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Back again. Stevensville Middle School, Energy Transfer Solutions, LLC. I promise you this is the last one tonight. Um, I accept the promise. <laughs> Good evening again, board members. Um, I'm seeking approval tonight for a contract with Energy Transfer Solutions, LLC, um, to replace the existing heat recovery water-cooled unit. Um, it's actually CU7, uh, master and secondary units uh, with generation five heat recovery, <coughs> excuse me, heat recovery water-cooled units at Stevensville Middle School. Um, currently, we have uh, 12 classrooms that are down. Um, we're providing uh, portable heaters for them to um, have the proper temperature in the classrooms. Um, this is a um, basically, um, it's a uh, split ductless system throughout the school. There's 179 actually split ductless uh, units in that building. So this one controls 18 of those and it's uh, 16 tons of heating air conditioning. Um, one of the fortunate things we're, if approved, we're able to do the work in a mechanical room during school hours so it would not interfere with any of the instruction that is going on. Um, that is one area that we are lucky for. Um, this would be an emergency um, sole source procurement and we're seeking that in the amount of $46,695. I, I would like to add there is about an eight week um, delay on receiving these items once once approved. Any questions? It's something, I'm something, sorry. it's something we got to do and uh, but just you, you we are taking care of the rooms with accelerate heat as far as to make it yes and it's gonna get cold which could be a yes, problem sir. but yes sir that's all president I move that we approve the contract with energy transfer solutions LLC to replace existing heat recovery water cooled units with generation 5 heat recovery water cooled units at Stevensville Middle School the amount of $46,695, budget source, fiscal year 23, maintenance, unrestricted budget. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. We have no uh, citizen participation, correct, at this point? Uh, future meetings and events. Smith, when's our next? Uh, We're gonna have our next. <laughs> we, we will not have a work session uh, in two weeks due to the holidays. Our next regular meeting will be January the fourth, with you. our work session on January eleventh, with our adopted schedule for our budget hearings. Okay, that's it for tonight. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We adjourn. Thank All you. In favor. All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.